Thank you for having me. Um, let me first acknowledge a uh, large group of people who've supported this project at Cornell. So uh, the larger project has been supported by the Atkinson Center grants, as well as the Migrations Initiative um, at Cornell. And my collaborators include Nancy Chow and Amanda Rodewald from Economics and Natural Resources at Cornell, as well as two amazing students, Mario Molina, who's now a postdoc at NYU Abu Dhabi, and Julia Zhu, who's about to finish her dissertation at policy analysis and management. So the first part of the talk will be a joint project spearheaded by Mario. The second part is, um, is basically um, um, under Julia's um, you know, leadership. So um, in, in the series of papers, we're trying to understand how environmental events affect human mobility. And obviously there's more and more interest in this topic in the context of climate change. We expect uh, both the frequency and severity of um, weather related um, disasters or events to increase in the next um, several decades. And we worry about human displacement as a result of that. And much of the literature is actually looking at how historical changes in temperature and precipitation have shaped migration flows. So we've actually, we're looking into that um, in our work as well. There's also a separate line of work that studies more sudden onset events like hurricanes uh, or other natural disasters, but we're not looking into that in this part of the work. Now, some of the findings that we've started to accumulate are quite consistent across studies. For example, if we look at the Latin American or Mexican setting, um, studies like Munshi's work shows that low rainfall in Mexico brings more US bound migration. And the positive mechanism there is lower agricultural yields. When it doesn't rain, then you can't produce and you're cash stripped and migration offers an adaptation strategy. Later on, uh, Fang and others work have, um, has tested the, this particular mechanism, the decline in agricultural yields and show that indeed when rainfall is low, agricultural yields go down and there's more US migration. But then there are other findings that are quite mixed and puzzling. And one particular example I picked, but there are many, is Rios Mana and colleagues work where they find, um, like in other work, low rainfall in Mexico brings more US migration, but it, it only happens in well-off communities. And the argument there is it's these resourceful communities that are able to finance migration because migrating from Mexico to the US is a costly endeavor. So you need some resources. But then in the same paper, they look at temperature shocks when temperatures are too high, um, then they observe the opposite pattern that they observe higher migration response only in poor communities. So basically we have two potential weather stressors, low rainfall and high temperature, creating this different impact in less or more vulnerable communities. So this is just one example, but it's, it's basically pointing us to a more general problem in the literature. Now, we don't know the correct specification for weather fluctuations. In other words, we don't have social science theories to guide what kind of weather would create what kind of a response. And furthermore, there's a lot of heterogeneity across communities, right? So communities may have different normals. Uh, for example, cold weather in Ithaca will mean something different than cold weather in, uh, say, California. So the normal temperature of a community really makes a difference, and studies correct for that differently. Some studies look at historical normals, let's say between 1960 and 1990. Some studies argue that we need to look at more recent periods, let's say from 1980 to 1990. So that creates differences in the models and the results. And maybe kind of a more difficult problem is that weather fluctuations can create a delayed response, right? So for example, first year of kind of low rainfall might not create an impact because there's an irrigation system in the community. But then if this kind of lack of rainfall continues over time, then suddenly you start seeing the impact. Uh, and this way, weather fluctuations can create a cumulative response. And few studies actually consider such intensification. Another alternative is the opposite of intensification where communities adapt. As you see rainfall kind of dropping, maybe you change crops. So that way the effect of this weather change on migration behavior could be reduced over time. And this is what is known as adaptation. And all of these processes would imply a different kind of empirical specification and would lead to different results. 
So basically, when we kind of put all of this together, we can see that the impact of weather on migration might be characterized by first complex interactions between weather today and weather in the past. And we can consider various lags. Is it last year, two years ago, three years ago? And we can also imagine that these factors would interact with community level factors, uh, like vulnerability of communities, past migration experience in the community. We might imagine migration responses to be higher, let's say in a community with a well-established history of migration because of existing ties between migrants already in the United States and people back home. Now, how do we consider all these complex interactions? Obviously studies testing for different things would find different results, but we ideally want to consider all possibilities in one study. But that becomes really difficult because we might end up with a model that has more parameters than observations. So let's imagine you have 50 variables. Let's imagine you want to consider all the interactions among them. This gives you two to the power of 50 parameters, and suddenly you have more things you want to test than the data at hand. And second, even if we were able to select particular relationships and test particularly for them, with a sufficiently sophisticated or complex model, we might overfit the data at hand. In other words, if we're testing our model on a single data set, our results may be capturing the idiosyncratic features of that data set and might not generalize to other forms of data, even from the same setting. Now, how do we solve these issues? So in the first part of the project spearheaded by Mario, we're using machine learning tools um, that allow us to fit really complex models without overfitting the data. Now, machine learning is a fast growing field. It sits at the intersection of um, computer science and statistics, and it basically seeks to automate discovery from data. So in the past, intelligent systems tried to call, code all outputs for all possible inputs, but nowadays, intelligent systems are actually learning from data by estimating these really complex functions. Now, we wrote a review piece for the annual review of sociology on this topic uh, that applies to many social science fields, we believe. So if you're interested, um, you can read that. So in that review, we basically distinguish between two classes of these tools. So unsupervised machine learning is basically discovering representations of some input X. For example, in my book project, I looked at if there were different migrant groups among the pool of migrants from Mexico to the US. So I use something called cluster analysis. Here, we're using uh, the other category of tools called supervised machine learning tools. So here, the goal is to link some input X, and in our case, the most important input is weather fluctuations, to an output Y, like who migrates, in order to make predictions on new data. Now, how does this work? So in the social sciences, we're used to working with um, regression models, and ordinary least squares is a prime example, where we basically propose a simple model that might have produced the data. And then we estimate the parameters of that model from the data, and then we interpret them. So we're looking for beta parameters that describe how X, the input, is linked to an output Y. Does weather changes, do weather changes, for example, increase migration? So we would expect a positive beta there. Now, the downside of this approach is we ignore model uncertainty. So we fixate on our model and we don't consider all the alternative models that could be similarly applicable. We also ignore out of sample performance. Basically, we estimate the parameters and interpret these parameters on the same data set. So we don't necessarily assess how well that model could perform on a different data. Now, supervised machine learning addresses some of these issues, but it has its own issues as well. So here, we're not considering a simple model. We're considering very complex, often non-parametric models. And our goal is to, imp to improve predictive accuracy on new data. So we're selecting our model based on its ability to predict not only on, a, on our data set at hand, but a separate portion of the data that it hasn't yet seen. But the downside is we often end up with black box results. In other words, we're not getting these beta coefficients that describe the nature of the relationship between X and Y. So we don't gain kind of particular insights, but we do gain predictive accuracy. Now, this approach can allow us to answer a simple question. Can we predict migration 
And can we predict migration better when we consider weather? In other words, is there value in considering weather as an important factor in human mobility? Now, the method we're using is based on the so-called regression trees. So basically, it, you can imagine this, it, it, it's like a tree-like model that describes a sequence of splits in our explanatory variables, the x, with a prediction for the outcome y at the end node. So I'll kind of try to give a very simple example. The advantage of this model is it captures nonlinearities and complex interactions in X. Let's say that we want to predict whether someone migrates. It's a zero one outcome. And we have two input variables, age and education. So our regression tree might split first by age. So it first differentiates between young and old. And then each of these branches might split further into um, college and no college education. And at the end of this, each of these branches, we might have a prediction, a migration prediction. So here we see that in this data or in this kind of stylistic example, young and college educated are migrants, everyone else is a non-migrant. Now we use a version of this um, uh, you know, method that averages over thousands of trees and this method has the name random forests because we're averaging over all these trees. And this improves the predictions compared to a single tree. But then whereas a single tree would be more interpretable in terms of the relationships it describes, the random forests are less interpretable, but more predictive. So um, our data here comes from the so-called Mexican Migration Project. So we basically have data on over 140,000 individuals. Most of them are interviewed in Mexico and about 20,000 of them have migrated to the US at least once. So the way these data were collected was researchers went to a few communities in each year. They canvassed the communities and they randomly selected 200 households and they collected life history information on all household members, including the absent migrants. Um, in that. So we can basically use this retrospective life histories to create a panel data set that captures the time period from 1965 to 2019. But because the weather data, the detailed weather data are available after 1980, we restrict our analysis to this period, like post 1980 to today. And the weather data come from the NASA Earth Observing System. And this is the finest resolution data we have on weather changes. So we have daily information on every kilometer square grid on the surface of Earth. So we basically take the communities surveyed by the Mexican Migration Project, obtain their shape files, and then you impose on them this gridded weather data and then average over the grids to look at daily weather changes in these communities over the last 40 or so years. Now, here's kind of an important lesson that we've learned. A lot of the work in the literature uses lower resolution data. So basically they use weather changes at the state level or at best at the municipality level. But there is a big difference in the results. And here kind of we can see why. Here we're showing um, the weather, um, the precipitation levels in year 2000 by the state level on the left-hand side figure and by the municipality level on the right-hand side figure. And we're comparing each region to its own normal weather and normal weather we define as the weather between 1980 to 1990, so this 10 year period. And we're computing the standard deviation difference in 2000 from that normal. And red means, that they had less rainfall than the normal period, and blue means they had more rainfall in terms of standard deviations than the normal. So on the left-hand side figure, we immediately see that most of the states are either whitish or pale red, meaning that there's a decline, persistent decline in rainfall in Mexico, even in the 10-year period from the normal. But we also see on the right-hand side menu, uh, right-hand side map, if we look at it at the municipality level, the variation is a lot bigger. So let's take the state of Sonora, for example, in this green rectangle. If we look at the state level data, it seems as if there's nothing has changed between the normal period and 2000 because we have um, the white color. 
Uh, but then if we look at the municipality level, we have blue regions and pinker regions, meaning that some municipalities receive higher than average, others receive lower than average. So if we were only to look at the state level, this variation would be masked. And community level is even tinier than the municipality, which is hard to show on this map. So we learned quite quickly that this effort in getting really fine resolution data really paid off. And we can see the same patterns with temperature as well. Now, now, let's kind of talk about what indicators we're considering other than weather. Our output is first migration trip to the US. We have information on repeated trips as well, but for this work, we're only focusing on first migration because it's easier to kind of avoid endogeneity issues where people get richer, perhaps more educated, their family structure changes as they migrate back and forth. And then as the key inputs, we're considering um, you know, individual and sociodemographic characteristics like age, sex, education. Uh, we also consider household wealth uh, by looking at household land, properties, businesses. We're considering at the household and community level, prior migration experience, and also rural urban status and so on and so forth. So in terms of the weather indicators, and this is where the machine learning approach really shines, we don't have to really make a choice. We basically canvas the entire literature and include all the measures that we have seen in the literature um, as linked to migration patterns. And we also measure each weather measure at various lags. Um, last year, two years ago, three years ago, going back five years. So this way we can see if weather events have a long arm in terms of their effect, if there's intensification, if weather two years ago really impacts the effect of this year's weather, so on and so forth. So we can really introduce complexity into the model. Now, here's an important difference of these models from the traditional uh, or, you know, regression approaches. In ordinary least squares, the goal is to find a model that best fits our sample. So we typically use the same data set to select the model and to assess its performance. So we estimate our model, look at the parameters, and then we look at the R square, the share of explained variation. Now in supervised machine learning, the goal is to predict well, not just in sample, but also out of sample on new data. So we want our model to generalize. So to ensure that we split our data into three components. We use the training data to fit different models. Then we use the validation data to select the best model among them. And then we keep aside a so-called test data to assess the final performance of our best model. And we haven't yet in this project touched the test data. We're kind of reserving this until the very end. So basically we have about 140,000 individuals in the data. We assign half of them to the training data randomly. We put 25% of them into validation data and 25% of them are still waiting in the test data to evaluate our final model. Now, the question is, can we predict migration with these really complex models? Well, if we take a naive approach, we immediately see, yes, we can predict it and too well, but that is largely due to the imbalance in the data. Now, we have about 2 million person years. Remember, we have about 140,000 individuals, but we're observing them in every year, but only 20,000 first migration events. So less than 1% of the observations. So a model that always predicts no migration or non-migrant is accurate 99% of the time. So we need to factor this imbalance into data. If we do that, we see that we can't really predict migration well. We actually do quite well in the training data. So here we can see how much of the actual non-migrants and migrants our model is able to predict. So we can see we can predict non-migrants with 100% accuracy, and we can predict migrants with 87% accuracy. But this is only in the training data. So this is the data that um, we use to fit the model. When we look at the validation data, the data that we set aside, we see that we're miserable. We can still predict non-migrants pretty well at 99% accuracy, but for migrants, we only have 6% accuracy. So this is quite terrible. This tells us that we're overfitting the training data. In other words, we're capturing both the signal and the idiosyncrasies of the training data. 
Now, how do we correct for that? We can tell our model not to be too complex. So we can restrict the tree depth to 30. And when we do that, our predictions improve on the new data. We can also change the relative cost of making a mistake for migrants versus non-migrants. So we can tell our model that it's a lot more expensive to make a mistake on who's gonna be a migrant than who's never gonna migrate. When we do that, our predictions improve um, quite a bit. So we, now we can predict migrants with about 53% accuracy, which is still not you know, amazing, but our predictions for non-migrants have dropped. If we further tinker with this, the cost of making mistakes, we can actually um, make the predictions for migrants quite accurate at 99%, but then our predictions for non-migrants suffer. So I'm just showing this to you to show that there's always a trade-off uh, in the choices that you're making for the models. Now, um, we can also move on to our next question. Can we predict migration better when we consider weather, when we consider all these different measures that we included in the model? So this is a way of assessing, this graphic is a way of assessing that. So this is called the receiver operating characteristic curve. The name is not very descriptive, but basically, on the left-hand side, it's showing the true positive rate of our model. And on the x-axis, it's showing the false positive rate. So a perfect model would jump right to one. So the true positive rate would be one and it would stay there even when we change the parameters a little bit, right? Now, so the closer the curve of our model to that ideal, the better our model. So one way of assessing that is looking at the area under the curve. And for a perfect model, the area under the curve would be one. And uh, this would mean that we're predicting the outcome with 100% accuracy. And higher the area under the curve of our model, the better our predictions. So the red curve here is showing um, the curve for the models with no weather. And the other ones are different iterations of um, you know, the, the, the models with the weather indicators. So when we include no weather data, the area under the curve is 79.79. So this means that our accuracy of our predictions is 79%. So we can predict the migrant with 79% accuracy with our best model if we don't include weather. When we include weather, it improves, but only marginally to 80 to 81%. Now, what does this tell us? Can, can we predict migration better with weather indicators? Yes, but only slightly. And can we predict migration better with these really sophisticated tools compared to OLS? So we compared our model to a simple logistic regression with a bunch of hand-selected weather indicators. We see that the predictions of this, the complex models are better, but only slightly. With a simple logistic model, we can still achieve about 78% accuracy. Now, this actually finding or a non-finding is in line with a recent experiment um, that appeared uh, uh, at PNAS. And I wrote a commentary on that experiment. So basically here, um, they provided uh, a, a social science data set called the Fragile Families data. And this data set includes about 4,000 individuals with various life outcomes like eviction, uh, high school dropout rates, so on and so forth. So they've been following these families over time. And they set up a competition where they invited teams of researchers to come and try to predict outcomes in this data set. And 160 teams uh, basically entered this competition. And the findings show that, first of all, no model had um, great accurate uh, predictions uh, of any of the life outcomes. And second of all, the really sophisticated models did only slightly better than the simple parametric models uh, that included a few expert chosen indicators. So in my kind of uh, commentary on that, I made a few points about this, about the unpredictability of individual outcomes and what this tells us. Um, and I think these comments actually apply to our case as well, because we find a similar uh, result here. First of all, it might tell us on the downside that our surveys, the Mexican migration data that I use, or you know, the fragile families data, might be missing key aspects of people's lives. In other words, we're capturing you know, things like people's age, education, wealth, but maybe we're capturing, we're missing other things that are equally important for their migration or other life outcomes. 
Second, this might tell us that maybe life outcomes are too idiosyncratic at the individual level, and there is a predictability ceiling. Even with the best data or the best models, maybe we can only predict so much. And as social scientists, maybe we can predict aggregate patterns, like how many people will migrate in response to an event, but maybe we can't predict each and every individual's behavior. So these are all kind of downside, but the upside is that existing parametric models, simple approaches that we have or theory driven selection of models actually performs quite well. So um, what we're doing in the social sciences, in other words, is really, really worthwhile. And maybe the purchase of these methods is not as much as we um, expect them to be. Now, in the second part of the um, talk, I actually want to kind of move in that direction. Basically, this is the part where Julia Zhu, um, our student, is spearheading the, the effort. Here, the question we're asking is, um, is different. So here we're asking, can we use our domain knowledge, what we know about the Mexican setting, what we know based on our fieldwork and the literature to specify and test specific relationships? In other words, we don't want to throw everything in the model as we did in the first one, but we want to carefully specify these relationships. And here, our field work in Mexico um, two years ago is, um, is really um, helpful and it has been formative. So we went to um, talk to coffee producers in Chiapas. So coffee is a plant that's really impacted by weather fluctuations. We also talked to corn growers in Jalisco. And some of the things we learned were not that surprising. Um, first of all, every farmer recognizes that weather is a lot more unpredictable now. Here's a corn farm in Jalisco is talking about, and these corn farmers are all by the Lake Chapala. And they talk about how when, when you don't know when it's going to rain, you can't even plan where to um, plant because you don't know how large the lake is going to get. So that unpredictability is a hardship. Similar pattern um, is noted by coffee farmers in Chiapas. Um, this coffee farmer is saying that whenever the coffee harvest was over, we would cut the trees because we knew that in May the rain would come. But now it's hard to know. Everything is unpredictable. Second, and this was really, really important uh, for our modeling, this farmer is talking about how weather now is not only different, but it comes in different combinations. So it's not just that we have lower rain, rainfall or higher temperatures now, but things combine in different ways. So this farmer says, there's a change that now it rains and when it rains, it gets hot. It used to not get hot. In other words, the, maybe the rainfall, the effect of rainfall is different now because it's combined with this other factor. So we need to take that into account. Then, Farmers recognize that bad weather reduces harvest and also poor harvest leads to death. In other words, having poor harvest this year does not mean that you just suffer this year, but you have to recover from the death because you've still invested in your fertilizers and other things. So even if next year's weather is good, you might still have some recovering to do. Again, this tells us that we need to look at it over time, not just this year's weather, but maybe many years in sequence. And many people recognize migration as an alternative. Um, so this coffee farmer said, there's no coffee produced anymore, and that's why young people are leaving. But migration in this setting is costly because hiring a smuggler nowadays costs around $3,000 to cross the border without documents, so that requires some savings. And debt from a poor harvest can actually stall it. So even if migration is an alternative, it's an adaptation strategy, it might not be available to everyone. So these are the insights that we took into our quantitative analysis. And we carefully specified a model where our outcome is still the first migration trip. And we're considering precipitation and temperature in the previous year, as well as the year before that. So we're considering two year sequences. We cannot do five year lags here as we did in um, you know, the former paper because it's, it, it, it kind of renders the model too complex. And there are many layers we want to introduce into this model as well. And we also include other indicators as well as state and year fixed effects. Now, here are the layers that we're introducing based on the insights um, that we gained. So we're including interactions between precipitation and temperature to consider how different combinations of these things matter. In other words, does low rainfall 
uh, you know, reduce migration or increase migration, or does it only work when it's combined with extreme temperatures? Second, and this is a little bit different from the literature, we're not just considering bad weather events like very high temperatures or very low rainfall, but we're also considering good weather events. What happens when weather is really favorable? Can you save money and can that lead to more migration? So we're looking at the full spectrum. And like some of the studies in the literature, we're comparing each community to its own normal. Um, so for each community, we correct or we look at the deviation from its normal in the last decade. And that way we're taking into account adaptation. So we're taking into account the fact that very hot weather in an already hot place will not mean much, but very hot weather in a cool place will actually create a large impact. And finally, we introduce interactions across temporal lags. So we interact last year's weather with the weather two years ago. So that way we're trying to find out if sequences of events matter. In other words, can good weather last year make up for really bad weather two years ago? Or having, uh, does having two consecutive years of terrible weather create an impact that one year of weather, bad weather does not on its own? And then we test for heterogeneity by household wealth status. Remember, we said that migration is costly. So is this an alternative only available to wealthy families or can the poor migrate as well? Again, we're using the Mexican Migration Project, but this time we don't use the entire data set. We focus only on rural communities because the mechanism we have in mind is very particular. We think bad weather affects agricultural yields and through that leads to migration. So to be able to test that mechanism, we take out the urban um, and metropolitan communities from our sample. And this gives us still a lot of information from about 56,000 individuals that come from 13,000 households. And we focus on the period between 1991 and 2018, uh, and we consider 1980 to 1990 period as the normal period. And all weather indicators in our data for temperature and precipitation are computed as deviations from the mean in that normal period divided by the standard deviation. Now, basically uh, we create five weather categories. So very wet is if you receive rainfall that's outside two standard deviations of average uh, uh, rainfall in the normal period and so on and so forth. So again, it ranges from very dry to very wet and temperature ranges from very cool to very hot. Every com community being compared to its own normal. What do we find? First of all, that farmer is absolutely right. Combinations of rain and heat matter. In other words, low rainfall by itself is not enough to induce migration, but when low rainfall is combined with extreme heat, that's when we see the migration response. And we see that both good and bad weather matters in different ways. Good weather especially matters for poor families, as we'll see in a minute. And uh, we see a very strong heterogeneity by wealth in migration responses. Basically, rich households migrate when last year's weather is bad. This tells us that they can respond immediately. If you have a terrible season, you know that the next season, many rich families, wealthy families, will be sending migrants to Mexico. So here we show some coefficients. So we see that when it's very dry and hot last year or dry and very hot, we see this positive coefficients for wealthy families, but no such coefficient for poor families. Poor families on the other hand migrate when last year's weather is good. So it's the opposite when it's wet and very cool, that's when poor families migrate. And again, this kind of speaks to resource, resource constraints, given that migration is really costly, only rich families can afford to send migrants. But why do poor families send when the weather is good? This becomes clear when we consider sequences of weather events. We see that poor households migrate when last year's weather is good, but two years ago's weather is actually bad. So basically you experience adversity, you experience favorable conditions after that, only then can you send migrants. For rich families, the sequences don't matter because they can respond immediately. Now, what does this entire project tell us? We can clearly see that in the Mexican setting, migration offers 
an adaptation strategy to weather. But we also see that it's a st strategy that's available to rich households more readily. They can resort to this choice faster than the poor, but poor have to experience certain events in certain sequences in order to migrate as a result of weather changes. And from an analytical perspective, um, considering combination and sequencing of weather events and their full spectrum, also considering measuring these things at very fine resolution is really crucial in understanding weather migration linkages. Now, connecting back to the first part of the project, what do we gain from both of them um, is a question that we're asking ourselves. So one thing that we realize is these well-specified parametric models, as we did in the second um, part of the project, offer insight into the mecha mechanism. So they're really valuable. They also show us this heterogeneity, uh, but then non-parametric models, the machine learning models are also helpful in pointing out the limitations of our models in terms of their predictive accuracy. In other words, even if our, our best models may not be as predictive at the individual level as we hope them to be. So we see these approaches as potentially complementary. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts or answering any questions. <laughs>